All right, our friends, we're back with another um, another episode of VA Radio. Do you have an adjective for us? I do, sir. We have another redoubtable episode <laughs> redoubtable. of VA Radio. <laughs> yes, from the ancient Mesopotamian word meaning commanding or evoking respect, reverence, or the like. Wow, wow. I thought it was like... Uh... You know, you can doubt us one more time because... <laughs> That's what I thought, too. <laughs> we're full of nonsense. Uh, I'm Kevin Oste, joined, as always, by our esteemed co-host, Mr. Mike Cuball clark And uh, uh, what uh, what the heck is going on back in the garage this time, huh? Yeah, back in the garage. The weather's finally nice. It's not a, a an ice box in here, so uh, it's this is where I like to be. Right. Yeah, me too. Me too. It's nice. Mm-hmm. Finally, the weather's breaking here in the Midwest, and uh, uh, actually drove the seventy Riv today for a little while. Nice, yeah, very nice. Always kind of have that. Uh, I mean, I, I get to drive it every once in a while, but I always make the list. You know, as soon as you get behind the wheel, it's like, oh yeah, I forgot that wheel bearings making noise, and <laughs> yeah, I got to do an yeah. oil change, and this weather strip mm-hmm. is coming apart, and blah blah mm-hmm. blah. So the uh, list is ever growing, but that's okay. That's why we do this but- stuff. Part of the joys of classic car ownership. That's right. They never keep you bored. <laughs> you got that right. Yeah, yeah. So we typically start this show with a uh, trivia question in which uh, we uh, we stump each other's uh, mm-hmm. chumps, respectively. <laughs> 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 and you had alerted me uh, that you had one. Yes. In fact, your text was... I have a good trivia question, not some BS <laughs> off the wall nonsense either. Exactly, <laughs> which which effectively put me on notice. I think, yeah, pretty much. Well, I, I found it pre- I found it pretty interesting, so I wanted to to throw it out there. All right. So, were, were you suggesting that my questions are off no, the wall no, no, nonsense? no, no? I, I, I'm talking only about me, man. <laughs> only about me. <laughs> not the kind of crap that you put out. <laughs> right. I got not a the good rivel that everyone else has to listen to mm-hmm. but mine's good stuff all right well mr good stuff why not why don't you go first all right well let's do it okay uh kevin if you happen to be a gi in the mid 60s and wanted to, uh, say you were stationed in germany and uh you heard about this really cool new car called the mustang from ford and you wanted to buy one however if you found if you try to buy a mustang in germany you'd be buying a uh, a commercial vehicle uh, as another company called uh, Krupp Motren und Kraftwagen Fabriken <laughs> had owned the rights to the name Mustang. So, in order for Ford to sell that in Germany, what did they call the Mustang in Germany? Yeah, that is a, a great question because um, you're right. They didn't have the, the access to the name. And, and I'd also heard that uh, Ford kind of rationalize that a little bit by potentially suggesting that the idea of the wild Mustang horse might not have resonated with the the European market as well. Although I certainly think it would have, you know? Yeah, I think so too. Um, so I, I knew the name at one point and it's, it's something like the T2 or the, uh, the TKO mm-hmm. or, or not the TKO? It, it, it's uh, <laughs> no, no. It, it, I believe mm-hmm. it's a, a letter number combination. It's not really a name. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm just trying to remember what they are. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, that's the trick, isn't it? Yeah, that that's <laughs> that's the, the root of your <laughs> that's, no that's why we're BS, here, right? <laughs> not off the wall nonsense question. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, man, what the heck was it? These are the aggravating ones because I knew this. Right. I'm just to to keep our listener uh, from going out of his or her mind. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just gonna say the. Oh man, what am I gonna call this? Because I I know. Uh, you know, in Europe, they use a lot of acronyms that mean stuff, you know, like mm-hmm. the the sister company of, of Ford being Mercury. You know, in the 80s, right. you could buy an XR4 Ti, and right. there was an XR series uh, a four-cylinder turbo intercool. So all, everything had a, had a, or injected, it wasn't intercooled injection. 
So, uh, oh man, I, I know why it is. I don't know what it is. So I'm just going to mm. call it the, the, uh, the T. I know. Bum, bum, bum. <laughs> I, it could be, I could call it the, you know, the, the F U at this point. It's, really bad. <laughs> it's a letter number. So, so the M1 is what I'm going to call it. But the M1. Yeah, but please give me a little, uh, credit at the end because I know why, but I don't know what. Uh huh. All right. So Kevin is going the BMW route and saying M1. Yeah, but that's not what it is. It's, I think it's got a T in it. I guess we'll find out. Yes, Kevin, <laughs> we'll find out at the end of the show. Uh, uh, <laughs> if it comes to me, I'm going to blurt it out halfway through, but oh, I, d- I doubt right. it. All right. All right. All right. Well, I guess uh, I'll reciprocate with a trivia question. All right. Let's have it. Um, How do I phrase this? Because there's many potential trivia questions in this. Oh, boy, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I guess uh, I guess we'll say that uh, General Motors was the, the first company to offer an automatic uh, high-beam dimming system on their cars. Automatic high-beam dimming system, okay. Right, and this is a safety and courtesy feature. As you're yeah, yes. motoring down the highways and byways of the world, somebody, and you got your high beams on because it's dark, as right. somebody approaches you, it senses that and dims the lights. So we can make this a three parter. Oh, aren't you kind? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I'm trying to, th- like I said, there's many ways to do this. We'll, we'll do one, one actual and two bonus. Wh- whichever way, twist the knife deeper. <laughs> yeah. We'll, we'll go with that one, all right? Well, this is purely because I'm so frustrated about the German Herr Mustang. That is, uh, so, what was the first year for this technology in a General Motors product? That's, that's the question. And the All bonus right. is, uh, what was the name of it? And oh, wow. the name changed... And what did it become? <laughs> you got it. Come on. Those are just bonus. You don't have to get Well, to, to, to steal your phrase, Kevin, you suck out loud. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. All right. I'll tell you one better. You get, right. a, you get any one of the three right, you win. How about that? Oh, all right. That's the kind okay. of guy I am. You're, you're quite the giver. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, auto headlight dimming, high beam dimming technology in GM cars. I'll say it started. It, it, it debuted in nineteen ninety four. Wow, ninety four, ninety four. It was a good year. Yeah, I'll for, say. For I'll, I'll, I'll say it came in on Cadillacs. Is what I, was is what I'm gonna hmm. guess. I mean, that's not part of the question, but. Adding your own potential bonus. Yeah, add my own little extra credit. (laughs) See if you'll take that. (laughs) Well, I did the Well, you were right about Cadillac, Mike. (laughs) Um, And it was called the... It was called the... All right, good. I don't feel so bad. Yeah. Uh, We'll say it was called... Auto high beam dimmer. All right. <laughs> and then it was changed to safety dim. Oh, good. Ooh, nice. Gr- like good that. gravy. All right. Uh, auto high beam yeah. dimmer. T- tap it in there, buddy. In tap 1994, it in. and then it changed to safety dim. Yeah. And how would you spell that? Is it like the Pontiac thing where it's safe <laughs> dash T dash dim? Yeah, sure, sure. All right, all right, if, you, if, if, if that gets me closer, then we'll say yeah. Right. I like that. Well, GM yeah. was known for making up words like that. Right. Mm-hmm. And uh, Posse you, traction. Yeah. Sure grip. Well, that was a, a Chrysler thing. Uh, <clears what the, throat> throat> anyway. So I digress. And you said the Cadillac as just a fun... Mm-hmm. A little Extra. tidbit. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right. Okay. You know, I noticed that bits only come in tids. You know, you can have a tidbit, but you can't <laughs> let, have like a tid part or a, a tid, tid section. Bite. Yeah, a tid bite. 
It's only yeah. a bit. Tidbit. Yeah. All right. Well, cool. That's noted, and uh, mm-hmm. we, we apologize for everybody who's listening because yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is agony yeah. even for us. Yeah, ten <laughs> minutes to get through this damn trivia question. <laughs> <clears throat> <laughs> so uh, I was reflecting on uh, on the last trivia question, which was about the stoplight in Cleveland, Ohio. Yes, sir. Uh, when I was in Ohio this past week. Oh, right. Yes, yes. And uh, had a, a tremendous visit uh, to Forge Line Motorsports. That's, yes, yes. Yeah, we saw that picture of you holding that giant, what was that, a 20-inch rim up Holding up with one one arm? Yes, that was a, a 20 by 12 and a half carbon fiber Oof. rim barrel. And it the, the manufacturer claims that they are laughably light because you pick it up and you laugh. You go, oh, <laughs> man, this thing doesn't weigh anything. That's nice. And it was, uh, it was an amazing, amazing visit. And, and, uh, and I'll tell you why. Lay it on me. Yeah, yeah, because you're sitting over there. Uh-huh. Uh, so what I learned about... Uh, Forge Line Motorsports is there is, and, and in full disclosure, they the reason why I was there is because they they hired our video production team to help them create some videos to help tell their story about the company and also about some of the wheels and about the process and uh, things they're going to use in in commercials and social media and stuff like that. We we do a lot of uh, video production for companies that are not just us. And, mm-hmm. uh, and I always enjoy doing that because, um, they chose us because we are a forge line wheel, uh, dealer at, at our sh- our own shop. We've built several mm-hmm. cars using forge line wheels. We know their product pretty well. Um, but we're also, a, an automotive genre production company. So if they, if they would have hired some guy with a camera down the street that normally does other stuff, you know, they might mm-hmm. not get the message as well as yeah as we do because we're car guys you know so right and that's that's hard to find in the tv world yeah you um, don't necessarily want to hire a wedding uh videographer to right. do the forge line wheel spot <laughs> right right <laughs> well you know and, and nothing against it. that that's one of the cool things about the business is if you're in a, a video production business <clears throat> you get to be exposed to a lot of different kinds of things you know true um true. and and we've done stuff for uh, a local landscaping company and and i've certainly Mm -hmm. shot weddings in the past and i I look at those as kind of fun exercises to get outside the box Um, but in this case it was it was full attention at at forge line um and this conversation that we're having is is not part of what they hired me for i'm just telling you this because i think it's cool right uh this isn't a placement or anything you know this is uh Uh this is organic so Mm -hmm. the the of the zillion things that i I learned and I really uh, admire about this company is so many people have seen forge line wheels on, you know, pro touring cars on the street and, uh, you know, at uh, racetrack events. And um, you you wonder, you know, like what's the deal, you know, because Mm -hmm. you can buy wheels from any number of different companies and I'm not saying any are better or worse than others. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, but the forge line brand is, is very popular in the high performance world. And, and what I learned is the story of how this company came to be. And the short version is that, uh, there's two brothers today that, that run the company, uh, Steve and Dave Shard and their father's involved and, and their father used to work at GM in Ohio. And at some point, learned that the Dayton Wire Wheel Company, which you're undoubtedly familiar with. No, absolutely. You know, anything with wires since 1914, you know, Uh chances are it's Dayton. Oh, Uh, right on. uh, So at one point, and I'm not 100% sure on the date, but years ago, the Dayton Wire Wheel Company was in financial trouble. So uh the Shard brothers, their, their, their dad actually went to the local bank and said, uh, I understand Dayton Wire Wheel's in trouble. And he was looking to get away from having a, a day job with, with GM. And he said, what's their problem? And, and the bank actually said, well, they, they, they've got cash flow problems. They got creditors that they owe. They've got some supply problems, you know, t- typical things that can happen to a business, uh, especially when the market is getting soft on their product. 
And and just like a you know an American fairy tale, he went and negotiated with the bank and with all the creditors and wow. obtained the company. Get and, out of here! Yeah, and 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 brought it back to a level of success. And his two sons were young at the time, Steve and Dave, and they both uh-huh. grew up working at Dayton Wire Wheel. So. These are young guys now who are learning how to re-spoke a wheel, how to assemble a spoke wheel, how to true a rim, how to make a rim, how to straighten them, how to chrome plate them, how to polish them, you know, how to do colors, Hmm. how to do everything about the wheel business, sizing, fitment, uh, uh, you know, learning about the strength of wire wheels. Because back then, I mean, there were indie cars that raced on Dayton wire wheels. Uh, and these were the, you know, one of the premier wow. wheel companies in the world. I, I did so not know this. There was a racing background there too. And, and Steve and Dave grew up because their dad also liked racing. So, so they grew up, uh, on the racetrack, uh, first that with, you know, go-karts and, and racing each other, but then, uh, racing, uh, uh, Yanko Stinger Corvair on, wow. on road courses. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And they pointed out that if you can, uh, if you can, if you can race a Yanko Stinger Corvair, you can drive just about anything because I would agree with that. The balance is a little different and everything else. So time goes by, and uh, so they realized that there was a hole in the market for an American-made, truly custom racing wheel. Okay, so by this time they're they're getting into racing bigger series and V8 cars and well, I guess maybe Porsche 944s and stuff like that so so still some import you know four cylinder cars but uh you could get racing wheels out of Italy or you could get them you know like BBS wheels in Europe but there was nothing made here in the US huh. so they set out to make an all american racing wheel uh and one that was designed to be raced primarily. Uh, and then if you wanted to drive it on the street, that's fine. But this was supposed to be a racing forged aluminum wheel. Mm-hmm. So they, they launched the, uh, uh, the Forge Line brand. They came up with the name Forge Line because forging had to be part of the, it's the first name, you know? Right. And the, the reason why everything is forged and, and the way forging works is you can, you can melt aluminum and pour it into a mold, and that's a casting. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know if you you remember the. I always think of the old uh, commercial for. Uh, oh, I don't know what candy bar it was, but they would snap the candy bar in half, and you would see little air bubbles inside. Oh yeah, you know when they when they melted it. Well, that's what happens with the casting: is you have little bubbles and pockets and porosity in the casting. Oh, okay. So. By by forging it, what you do is you start with a casting and then you smash it essentially under high amounts of pressure or weight, uh-huh. and it it pushes all the molecules together and and on a on a bigger scale it squeezes out all those air bubbles so you have more material in the same space. Right. Uh, but it it also kind of aligns the grain of the material so that it becomes stronger by design as well. So. They made what they call a race spec wheel. And at that point, I don't know if it was a two piece or a, a three. I think it was a two piece where they were welding the center into the barrel. Uh, eventually they got away from that. And now they do a one piece and a three piece. But at the end of the day, um, they were successful in making these race spec wheels. And I, I asked them, what's a, what's a race spec wheel? You know, what does that even mean? It's uh, a good because- question. To us, a wheel's a wheel. And he said, well, here's the deal. What we looked at was in order to design a, a, a spec wheel for a, a racing class, they, they looked at the series that the car was going to be raced in. Uh, they looked at the weight of the car. Then they looked at the power level of the car. Then they looked at the allowable wheel and tire size. Mm-hmm. Then they looked at the friction coefficient of the tire uh, for that particular class. Then they looked at the size of the brakes to see what would fit in there. And then design something strong enough that would fit in all those parameters and not fail, right? Right. Yeah, sure. So this is truly, you know, designed for that particular series. And then they would name the wheel based on that series. And Forge Line has kind of a unique naming system. So if it was designed for the trans, 
uh, the Grand Am series would be a GA, and if it was a three piece, it would be a GA three, and it was okay. a first design GA three one, you know, okay. whatever. Um, and then they put a, a high quality finish on the wheel as well um, to protect it, and also so that when people saw them, they would say, "Hey, that that looks nice," you know. Also, mm-hmm. uh, so so now this the story is filling out that these are two guys that grew up racing that are designing racing wheels that are tested. Uh, today, everything is designed in house with uh, with finite element analysis engineering done so it's it's tested before it's built it's tested after it's built these wheels perform number one Mm -hmm. uh and the fact that they they look awesome with their their finishes they apply is is kind of it's just as important but it's a secondary function and as they worked with different racing series they designed new wheels to fit those different specs so they did some for the trans am series they did some for the world challenge series uh you know and and you know the corvette racing and all that stuff right so people caught on and started running them on street cars that they were autocrossing or weekend warrior type uh, uh uh road racing and and as these you know, the cars that we've put them on, coincidentally, most of them have been 69 Camaros that have all been supercharged, <laughs> you know, right so on. like the ZR9 Cor- or Camaro that we did, the loose change Camaro, and, and we've yep. got this silver 69 in the shop right now getting the LT4 motor. Uh, they've all got forge lines, and some of those were style motivated and association motivated, like, you know, you want okay. the car to look racy, so you put the racy parts on it. Sure. But sure. at the end of the day, we don't have to worry at all that that customer can go track that car with those wheels That's and they're, right. they're there, you know, they're, they're not mm-hmm. going to be a weak link on this, uh, on this package. Right. And so, so the design and the, the, the company history is fascinating. The next thing that I thought was really, really cool is the manufacturing of the wheels. Right. That's so, right. That's what I like to see. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, the, the plant is in Dayton, Ohio and everything is us done so and it's it's very simple and very smart um so their designs and and when i say simple i'm not saying easy but i'm saying it it, they've taken complexities out of this stuff Mm -hmm. so they come up with a wheel design and they have an in-house guy uh engineer who designs it on screen and solid works and creates the the face design Mm -hmm. these guys don't own the forge uh, so okay. they, they bring those in, but it's an American supplier that supplies the barrels and, uh, an American supplier that supplies what I'll call the blank forgings that become the center. Okay. And when those two pieces arrive at forge line, uh, they, they match the, the barrel and the center to the customer's order for size and, and mm-hmm. style. The barrel goes through a process of getting machined to look nicer um, or if it's polished, they come in polished. The wheel center goes through a multi-step machine process using American-made CNC machines uh, to uh, refine that uh, that forged aluminum center into a stylized wheel face. Okay. You know? sure. and, and those operations are cool. They spin it, then they put it in this uh, uh, five-axis CNC machine that, that carves out the design. Um, and then when it comes out of that, there's a hand operation uh, of a grinding room. And you've got these guys who are just incredible craftsmen that are taking that center and using air-powered die grinders and little tools to to deburr the spokes and, and take any flashing off or anything that the CNCs didn't catch. And in okay. some, some cases, some of these wheels... When you look at them, the, if it's a spoked wheel, the spoke design is very, very intricate where it's like an I-beam shaped spoke. It's just not like a, a rectangular oh, thing. I got you. As you turn it and look closely at it, you can see there's concaves and, and little uh, faces of the spokes. Uh-huh. And some of that stuff is done by hand on the, in the grinding room. Uh, and especially if that finish choice at the end is going to be a transparent powder coat where you're supposed to see like a brushed line come through it, like a brushed aluminum right. appearance. Those are done by hand. So these guys are doing... Wow. Oh, yeah, yeah. They're doing cosmetic work in that grinding room as well. Huh. Once the center is ground, um, and, and at every station it's checked for, you know, to make sure it's still a, a proper shape and it's true and all that stuff. Right. Uh, but then it's it's cleaned 
uh, they, they have a, a powder coating facility in house and they clean all the machining oil off of everything. And then it goes to powder coating, uh, and they have a, a, a proprietary process to get these things clean so that their powder coating is show quality, you know, and, and, and nice. absolutely phenomenal. Yeah. And they've got a book of standard colors that they offer, but they also work with uh, another company that can supply absolutely any powder that's available in any color nice. you want. And, uh, for example, we used on the Lose Change Camaro, we had a, a, a brushed aluminum barrel, the wheel rim itself right. was brushed. Well, that sure. whole brush operation is done by hand. Wow. Uh, oh, it's perfect looking. And you would think yeah. there was some big thing that they'd put it in and, and a big drum sander would, you know, no, no, it's all done by right. hand. Huh. Um, and after the, the wheels are powder coated, then they go to the assembly table and, and one guy puts every, every single wheel together himself. Wow. And Jeez. there's a minimum of 40 ARP fasteners that bolt the the two barrels in a three piece with the center yeah. uh, together, and if you can imagine a racing wheel, it, there's a there's a possibility it's going to get damaged. Uh, it's either going to get scratched up, or you're going to leave the raceway and you know hit a uh, you know off track, whatever. Right, something tweak your wheel up. Yep, yep, and you yep. could bend it or something. So they're all designed to be disassembled and repaired. <clears throat> Wow. So that's, that's you, pretty slick. You can unbolt these wheels. And now if you're thinking like I was, I, I'm thinking here in the story and I'm like, well, this is an aluminum center and a, it's a stainless fastener. Aluminum and stainless don't really get along. Right. Because they'll gall and, mm-hmm. and they'll ruin threads. Well, they've got that covered because every one of these centers have helicoil inserts threaded into them. No way. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be darned. You know, so you can, oh, man. so you could take them apart and, and put them back together repeatedly and not yeah. you know change the strength of the wheel or or ruin any threats yeah. so there's a kind of a neat process where the assembly guy lays the barrel down and the face down and the the fasteners and kind of picks up the center so most of their wheel designs have what they call blind fasteners so when you look at it from mm-hmm. the front you don't see any bolts you look from mm-hmm. the back and that's where all the bolts come in so they kind of build them backwards um okay once he gets it tightened up uh each fastener is torqued properly. Then it gets spun on a, a Hunter digital uh, wheel mount machine to make sure it's still, you know, the, the front barrel and the rear barrel are lined up and everything. Uh, then they, they, they run a bead of silicone around it to uh, uh, make sure it doesn't leak at the two barrel junctions. Mm-hmm. And then they get boxed up and they get shipped out. So, so there's every kind of neat process you can imagine between the the 3D digital design, the uh, uh, 3D CNC machine process, then a craftsman hand process, then the powder yeah. coat process, then the assembly by hand, um, and so none of their wheels are welded anymore because they're all the three piece are bolted together. Okay, uh, and then they do a one piece monoblock wheel which comes in looking like. You know, if you take the cap off of an aerosol can, yeah, you, you know, a tall plastic cap, sure. Im- imagine that twenty inches around. Oh uh, boy, that's what the one piece wheel looks like when they come in, and the whole thing is machined at once. So Jeez. the back side of the barrel, the front side of the face, because there's no parts that it's all one piece. It's a monoblock. Uh, those come in at, at 120 pounds of aluminum, Oof. and they machine off like 80, 90 pounds of chips. <laughs> to to make the final wheel. Wow. I hope they recycle. Oh, yeah, yeah. And they've got these <laughs> conveyor belts of aluminum going out to recycle outside of the machines and everything. Yeah, it, it sounds like they, they really have a lot of attention to detail when they design and, and manufacture these wheels. And uh, uh, back to where you're saying they, they come and they get these blank hoops in. So I imagine when a customer orders these, I mean, I'm sure they have standard uh, offsets and backspaces that they offer, but a customer can call in and say, "Hey, I would, I would like you don't offer a like a five inch uh, backspace. Can I get this, you know, twelve inch wide wheel with a seven inch backspace and and this much of an offset?" And and they and they could do that. Exactly. Correct? Every single wheel is custom. Gotcha. There's nothing on the shelf. There is no oh, inventory. Wow. Made Oof. to order every single all month. just in time shipment. Well, and, and so that, that's a great point. Is the wheel industry is notorious for delays? 
if you order a set of custom, especially custom wheels, if it's an off-the-shelf wheel, you know, you might wait a couple of weeks. Some places might have them in stock. But when you're going to order something custom, you know, we're hearing lead times of, of uh, 14 weeks, you know, wow, uh, a three- and four-month lead time. And, and some of that is because the custom wheel manufacturers – uh, do different parts of the process themselves, and other companies do different parts. So what Forge Line tries to do is th- they preload their materials. So they've got tons and tons of barrels and rims and mm-hmm. centers. That is kind of their inventory. I see. So that when you order, chances are um, they can, I- as soon as the machines are finishing up, the existing runs, they can mm-hmm. pull the raw material off the shelf and make gotcha. yours. And then so they, they'll keep the components in stock, right? But, and then fit made is everything is made to order, right? And gotcha. you know they, you know, we're we're discussing some availability turnaround times, and it's based on certain races because fifty percent of their market is still racing. Uh, oh, good, so, solid, yeah, yeah. Uh, the other fifty percent being the street market, and they were they were talking about how if there's a big race coming up, they'll get a spike because guys want wheels, they want them repaired, whatever. Uh, but they can turn wheels around in three, four, five weeks uh, pretty consistently, as opposed to two or three months uh, like a lot of others because they manage <laughs> that material load. Uh, I gotcha. And then, like you're saying, um, the uh, part of the challenge is knowing what to buy because mm-hmm. wheels are are tricky especially when you're starting from a blank sheet with every one right so you can call them and say hey i got a 67 gto that i'm building and i want to put 18s and 19s on it you know and i, I like this particular series because they're different series yeah. and styles can you tell me what's going to fit yeah and they have that info do they? Uh, yeah, they'll ask you what breaks. They'll ask you what your usage because they they might say, well, you like this particular series, but it's designed for Miata spec racing, and okay. your GTO weighs a lot more. Uh-huh. <laughs> so maybe <laughs> you, you need to be in this series over here. All right. Um, and then if you if you don't know, uh, they can send you templates and stuff, and and have you measure, and and they're willing to uh, hold your hand on all that stuff because um, nobody wants to get custom wheels wrong oh boy howdy because they're made for that application you know but yeah the good side is that say something is off um you can unbolt the center and put it in a different barrel gotcha. and correct that um and what they find is they've, they've got repeat customers who it's like every year they want to change something so they'll send the wheels back have them unbolt them strip them repowder coat uh-huh. them a different color you know huh. and put them back together and send them back you know uh, okay. So you can do all that kind of stuff. Yeah, maybe they want to change the center. They can send it back and say, I want this center in here now rather than the one we have, and I want it this color, and then... Yeah, that. and, and yeah. Uh, I, I think when it comes to just swapping centers out, depending on the other specs on the wheel, it, it might be more prudent to get just a new wheel. But if mm. you're going to change that, send your wheel in and get your wheel back just have it you know change colors or get straightened mm. or something you know they, they do it all the time uh, right and on. another neat thing is they they also mount tires too so what what we have challenges with is you know we're talking about some expensive wheels um mm-hmm. and, and have, having gone through this process now I, I i understand and respect why you know it's because they're they're done right and there's a lot to it and they're all hand done that's not like this push the button and it cranks out you know 100 sets right um so when you get them, you got to choose your tire mounter carefully. Uh-huh. Yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, I scratched it. Right, right. <laughs> and and typically we're talking about an oversized diameter wide wheel, mm-hmm. which means it's going to be a skinny sidewall, high performance tire, yep. so which gets more challenging to mount with every one of these variables thrown in. I believe uh, it. Yeah, and and you got to work with somebody who's got a, a machine that isn't going to mar up that finish or mm-hmm. or scratch it. So, but today, now you can have your tires sent to them, or you can get tires. They got an arrangement with your tire rack, so you can pick tires and wheels, and then they'll mount them. And the shipping bill is going to be a little bit more, but that tire is actually right. going to protect that wheel in shipping. 
True. And good you'll point. know it's done Real right. Good point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so that that's a heck of a service. Um, but the picture that you saw was holding the carbon wheel, right? So that's the next yeah. generation. And I, I thought I knew a little bit about this stuff. And, you know, as typical, I don't know anything. <laughs> uh, but, but so how that story came to be is in a parallel universe to the Shard brothers who grew up racing and grew up around wheels their whole life, mm-hmm. there's a, a, a gentleman named Colin Snyder. And Colin is a, a younger guy, but he, he grew up racing go-karts and stuff. And he was part of the Formula SAE program um, in Kansas. And what that Formula SAE is a college engineering level racing series where big engineering schools compete against each other. Oh, sweet. And, and the engineers uh, uh, build the cars themselves. So our, our mutual friend Paul was at the U of I Formula SAE program many years ago. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, I did uh, not know that. Yep. And, uh, and this gentleman, Colin, was on the SAE team and... He was looking at the wheels of the of the cart that they raced, and they were aluminum. And he thought, you know, I bet we could save a bunch of weight if we made these in carbon. So he took it upon himself to make a set of carbon fiber cart wheels, and they raced them, and the thing acted totally different. It was really? just a huge improvement over yeah. over the uh, aluminum wheel. Ooh. So uh, Colin actually came out um, from and was on site at forge line and uh, interviewed him too about his whole process and, and what, what's the deal, you know, because carbon fiber is a technology that's been around for a while and it's a mm-hmm. typically a woven um, material of, of carbon filaments, little tubes basically mm-hmm. that you immerse in a resin um, kind of like fiberglass and then mold it into a shape. And mm-hmm. then you put it in uh uh, what they call an autoclave, which is like a vacuum bag that mm-hmm. sucks all the air out. Uh, and then when it hardens, yeah. you take it out of the mold and you've got your part. And the you don't see carbon wheels. You see carbon wings. You see mm-hmm. carbon prosthetics, you know, legs yeah. and stuff. You right. see carbon fiber body panels and, and uh, accessories, but you don't really see wheels. And there's a reason for that, and it's because it's super, super hard to do. <laughs> okay. And what 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 Colin noticed, and, and so Colin got a uh, an engineering degree, um, and then he went to work for a couple um, companies that do big league composites. He worked for an aircraft company. He worked for a, a defense company. He was just gleaning as much as he could with a life goal, truly of making carbon wheels. Huh. He is so focused. This this is what this guy wants to do. He doesn't want to make carbon fiber keychains or <laughs> airplane parts. Wheels is what he wants to make. All right. And he's convinced that uh, the entire we- world will be rolling on carbon fiber wheels at some point because of the benefits of the wheel. So I first saw the Carbon Forge line, they call it the Carbon Forge series, uh, at SEMA last year, and I thought, oh, that looks great. Oh, I bet it's light. This is all I know, you know. Uh-huh. Well, it turns out that a a woven carbon material doesn't work for a wheel. It's not strong hmm. enough. Um, and the strength that they were uh, having problems with, uh, and the Shard brothers at Forge Line had experimented with carbon wheels and they could get the, the the overall strength to be strong enough to where it would handle like impact going on the road. Where they were having problems is as soon as you put the tire on it and inflate the tire and it seats on the bead, mm-hmm. it would literally blow the wheel apart. Really? Because that is a, I guess that's a tension. It would be a t- tensile, tensile strength right. versus compression strength. Right. Yeah. And the material wasn't strong enough to hold itself together. Oh, I'll be darned. So they kind of gave up on it. And, and the other challenge that, that Forge Line had is, remember, their stuff is uh, modular, so they have interchangeable right. barrels and faces. Well, how do you have that with a carbon wheel, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, what, what Colin figured out is instead of using a, uh, a weave, he used a, um, a carbon braid. So it's a different... Oh. Right? It's almost, I don't want to call it a rope, but it's a ropier kind of braid 
okay. uh, which which changes the angles on a on a carbon weave. It's a forty five or a ninety degree angle of the weave yeah, on the like braid. That. Everything's intertwined together. Sure, right, and it's stronger. Yeah. So yeah. this guy has proprietary patented technology on his resins. That he made his own resins because they had Jeez. to be a certain strength. He's got design patents on the whole thing, and. Uh, came up with the barrel, and just like the aluminum version for Forge Line, there is a flange towards the front outside of the wheel that they drill and bolt a face to. Really? So now it's the same design philosophy as what Forge Line does, uh, because you can. So, so the Collins started a company called Emergent Technology, Emergent Carbon Wheels, I guess. And all Emergent does is make the barrel. And it's, right. a, it's a great story because Colin wanted to work with Forge Line. Oh, nice. He's got, he had this, this, you got to hand it to him. He's got his missions. I'm going to make yeah. these wheels. I'm going to work with Forge Line. So in order to approach them, he got a SEMA display booth, which costs a lot of money and mm-hmm. and he had some grant money and some inv- i guess some investment cash to get this company off the ground but he thought to himself if i have a booth i'm different from a guy that's just walking up with a wheel saying hey you know the old traveling salesman the suitcase and a wheel <laughs> right uh, so it gives a little air of legitimacy to him yes um and it worked because mm-hmm. the the shard brothers walked by and they saw this display and they went wow that that's pretty neat, and it looks like it might fit our process. And, uh, <laughs> and so, so Colin approached him and said, hey, guys, um, I'm Colin. This is my carbon wheel. This is what I've done to develop this. We've done non-destructive testing. We've done engineering on it. It's proprietary stuff, and, and uh, you know, we think it's kind of neat. Well, Forge Line, uh, Steve and, and uh, Dave said, we really want this, and we we're not saying we want to be exclusive cuz you know maybe that's not fair but maybe we can work something out where we get it first and mm. then and then the rest of the world gets it later so uh Colin went for it and that's how that marriage came to be right Sweet. so eventually emergent will be supplying barrels to other companies but right now uh-huh. it's it's through forge line and the fun thing was is once they got the uh, uh agreement going forge line applied their 25 years of, of forge line professional wheel engineering to the barrel and said, yeah, this might not work and this might not work, but if we tune it up a little bit, we'll get there. Uh-huh. So, so they did some design revisions and, and ended up getting there. Uh, and cool. now, now you can buy these wheels. Now the benefits are that a it's lighter, but, but uh, B it's so on, on a 20, on that big 20 inch wheel that I was holding, once yes. it's assembled with the aluminum face, it weighs like half of what the aluminum one does. Jeez. And it is far stronger at the barrel than the aluminum. And people have a hard time understanding the carbon is stronger and lighter. Um, right. So it, it delivers both. Well, well, why does that matter? Well, at the wheel side, you have what is known as the unsprung mass. Right. And this is your control arms, your spindle, your caliper, mm-hmm. uh, brake hardware, and of course the wheel and tire. And these are riding on the ground, and then the springs are supporting the car. Well, as you go down the road, uh, if there's a disturbance in the road and you have a high sprung or unsprung mass, uh, the inertia that is in the, the weight of the wheel and everything is hard to move and right. put back where you wanted it to go after you go over a bump. Right. So you can envision, uh, you know, the, in the gym, you got the heavy bag and you got the speed bag. Mm -hmm. You know, if the heavy bag is a, is a a heavy wheel and the speed bag is a light wheel, you punch that heavy bag. It doesn't fly across the room. It it has inertia. It stays in place. Mm -hmm. Well, that's how it is with your wheel and tire. Now, if you make that half the, the mass, right, you hit that bump, boom, that suspension system can react Mm -hmm. quickly. Because it doesn't have to overcome all that inertia. And then it goes back into position. Well, why does that matter? Well, that matters because as you hit a disturbance in the road surface, you lose traction. Mm -hmm. Lose traction, you lose control. So it's all about keeping control of the vehicle, and especially in a race car, but even a a regular driver. So, So that's the first one. The next one that I thought was pretty cool is 
that inertia also applies to steering the car. So now your steering system takes less horsepower, if you will, and leverage to be able to turn the wheels left to right. Right. And if you design the whole car, well, maybe you can take some of the robustness and weight out of the steering components themselves because you don't need something as strong right. to turn That's the wheels. Point. Right. And the same mm-hmm. way with the suspension, if you don't need to control if you don't need to control all that mass, you can have a lighter spring rate, you can change the shock and all that kind of stuff. Yep. So then the, the third one I thought was pretty cool is the the polar moment of inertia, and that is the spinning inertia. So he Colin came up with a neat demo where they, they mounted two hubs on a stand and they had a traditional wheel and then a carbon wheel and they wrap a fishing string around each one with a fishing weight. And the goal here is that you you release the weight and the gravity pulls the weight down, which turns the wheel, right? Okay. On the carbon wheel, a small little fishing weight, you drop it and all of a sudden the wheel spins and then the weight hits the ground. On a, on a heavier wheel, you let go of the weight, it doesn't do anything. That uh-huh. weight does not have enough uh, energy to overcome the inertia of that wheel. Right. So now it's easier to spin these wheels to get them uh-huh. going, and sure. it's far easier to stop them mm-hmm. and keep them from spinning. So now your brakes don't work as hard, and your car will accelerate faster because you don't have to overcome all this inertia. There's less mass to overcome, right. Right. And, and, and another characteristic of the carbon is that it's a little bit compliant, a little bit resilient. I don't want to say it flexes, but there's a comfort factor as well. Um, and on a, on a safety thing, they, they sent me a, a, a destructive test where they took a, a 2,100 pound weight and dropped it essentially on a wheel and tire that's inflated. And on the aluminum one, the rim actually bend a little bit, you know, deformed mm. slightly, uh, which eventually would lead to a failure. The carbon one, the weight bounced and, and wow. it didn't even care. And they said that when mm. these carbon wheels fail, so you hit a giant pothole or wreck a car or whatever, it doesn't instantly bend and stay bent it will uh it'll it'll change shape kind of come back but Uh it will slowly lose air and eventually go flat but you get to retain control much longer i see so if you have a an incident at speed you can you know you know you hit that bump you know you hit the brakes and by the time you stop you know maybe you got a few more minutes and then it goes flat okay so huh yeah right all this safety it is. It's, uh, mm-hmm. it's very uh, intriguing to, to see what they've learned. And then on the manufacturing side, Porsche, even Ford now, has a carbon fiber wheel on the, on the Shelby GT350R Mustang. Do but they? It, they do. Um, but they're also Ford Motor Company, so they, they've got a lot of resources to make stuff. I see. And theirs, the entire wheel is essentially one molded piece of carbon fiber. So the, the rim, the face. Now, if you're a custom wheel manufacturer, that would mean if you want a smaller diameter, you have to make another mold. Right. If you want to make a different style, you make another mold. You want another width, you make another mold, which Jeez. becomes cost prohibitive from a, a custom manufacturing standpoint right. because you got to engineer every one of those molds and right. blah, blah, blah. So the beauty there again gets back to that modular design concept of forge line so emergent can make however many different barrel sizes which is far easier and then forge line does their face and then you're good to go uh the downside boy are they expensive <laughs> 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 I was wondering if we were going to get to that part. <laughs> oh yeah, oh that's part of it, you know. And and uh, they they don't make any bones about it. I mean, they everybody knows these are expensive wheels. Well, um, I mean, come on, it's a it's a newer technology. It 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 has to be until it until it's a bit more prevalent. There's more out there, right? You yeah, know, these things start need to start paying for themselves. And yeah, so I mean, you're you're talking like fifteen, sixteen grand for a set of four wheels. Yeah. Woo, I didn't think it was that <laughs> expensive. Yeah, yeah. Right. And, Boy, howdy. Yeah, and to a guy like you and I, it's like, that's insane. But yeah. if you are a uh, uh, somebody of the caliber that can do that, they see the value. And they, they the value is being recognized because they're selling the wheels. 
Mm-hmm. And, and you have people, uh, in fact, uh, Forge Line was just at, at Barrett Jackson in Florida, and they were being approached because they were doing some theatrics with the, the wheel that, that I was oh, holding, yeah. you know, kind of juggling them around. And in fact, throwing it on the ground and bouncing it, you know, and not, huh. not hurting it. And you can imagine what a, uh, sideshow that was kind of creating mm-hmm. people checking it out. And, and, you know, the, the, the one factor we didn't talk about on the carbon is the appearance. The appearance is insane. You, you look at it. Um, and, and I made the distinction that the wheel is very precise. The rim is precise. It's true. It's round. It's got holes in it, you know, for the face. Uh, it's a very man-made, precise-looking thing. The braided carbon, because you can see through the resin, you see the fibers, is very organic-looking because it those braids do what they want to do when you put it in the mold. I mean, they they, they align to a certain degree, but it, it looks like a snakeskin kind of in there. Oh, really? So there's this this awesome, intriguing combination of unnatural and and man-made and organic uh-huh. appearance. Um, and the, the the weaves catch the light in a certain way where they kind of do a dance and so oh, it's neat. a it's a beautiful beautiful thing uh and people were looking at that across the room and then they're they're seeing that it's strong and everything else and and people would ask you know well you know i need to set how much are they and they would tell them you know they're you know fifteen sixteen thousand dollars and they had a lot of people who said well i just spent you know 12 or 14 grand on a set of custom aluminum wheels you know for, for my ferrari or for my oh. you know for whatever uh, yeah. cause that, that's in that market, you know, and they said huh. for another couple, I could have bought these. You're kidding me. So, huh. so that was also intriguing to me because I'm not in that universe. Um, no, I am. I'm not even, I'm nowhere near that universe, man. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't think I own a, outside of our truck. I don't think I own a car that's worth that at this point. Uh, <laughs> Likewise. but there are those who certainly are in that world. And yeah. they need to go there first so that eventually maybe you and I will have that yeah. opportunity. I mean, uh, I certainly see uh, professional race teams really getting all over this. If this helps them win a few more races or even one more race because of the, the dynamics that these wheels will give you for your race car, I see that being a winner. And yeah. I, like I said, I see I see race teams jumping all over this. If if it, I mean that much that much unsprung weight to shed is huge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it is. And and there is there is one kind of final little challenge that they are um, they're kind of going through, and it, it is regard to racing. And they put these wheels on their race cars and beat them up on the track and and didn't have any problems. Uh, but there is one aspect that they're not. 100% satisfied with yet but they're getting there and if you look at the the Ford Shelby GT 350R wheels mm-hmm. this, that OE level carbon wheel the insides are black they're not visible carbon and that's okay. par- part of the attractiveness of these wheels is that that visual appeal you know they yeah, want it sure and, and what Ford found and, and unfortunately Ford's line found the same thing is that there's a very uh uh rare situation on a racetrack where a piece of something can get between the caliper and the barrel and scratch up the carbon. Oh. And Ford solved it by painting a black ceramic coating on the inside of the wheel. Okay. And, and Ford's line doesn't want to do that because they uh-huh. like the way these look. Yeah. So look pretty cool. So, trying to keep the the high standard of performance and appearance all mm-hmm. together, you know, that that's something that they're kind of working on because they don't want to just paint the inside of the, the thing black. Yeah. You know? Right. And and they found that this occurrence of, of getting debris between the caliper and the barrel doesn't really happen on the street. You uh-huh. know, it's purely under super high intensity race sure. situation. So so for the street wheels are fine with it, you know, but on the race side that's a consideration. Um, hmm. But they also pointed out that on the aluminum wheels, for years, racers were saying, we'll run these things unfinished. We don't care. We just need the high-performance wheel. And Ford's was like, yeah, but, but we care. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we don't want people running around on unfinished wheels. You know, They'll perform well, the same way. That, that kind of goes back to what we were talking about. The, uh, I mean, it's kind of a, kind of a departure. But uh, if, if somebody has their car in your shop and you're painting it and they say, well, you know, I, I really don't care how, how good the paint looks. Just, just paint it. Yeah. Right. right. But, but we care. 
you right. know, this this is our our name on this, and it right. needs to be right. Yeah, so you so, came, yeah, you came to that. us, yeah, for a reason, and and uh, you buy forge lines, and that that's the the interesting thing about that fifty fifty race versus street market split. I I'm pretty convinced, and and now our audience knows the story. You didn't know the story. I didn't know the story behind that yeah. company. No, I didn't. I had and, no idea. And knowing that story, I want to. I feel you know compelled to maybe someday own a set of these wheels because I, I right. like what they're doing. You know, yeah, they're doing everything in the United States, advancing technology, using you know, right. tried and true stuff. Um, and that's one of the reasons why they hired us is to help them tell that story. Mm-hmm. But even not knowing that story, half their market is going to street people who think they just look cool. <laughs> right? So that right. that's an indicator of how important that finish is yeah. and style. I mean, knowing, knowing their story now, I want to be an evangelist for Ford, Forge Line. I mean, that's just, that's just great stuff. Everything they're doing is right, I think. Right. It, it's, it's admirable. Like I said, it's a likable company that you want to see do well. And there are yeah. others. I'm not saying they're the only ones by any stretch. Right. Right. There, and that's what I love about this industry is that there are so many people that saw something from racing or from doing whatever they were doing and were fueled by that to make that their career. And you want these people to succeed and mm-hmm. these companies. Um, touching on our last topic of the knockoffs and everything else, you know, <laughs> right. they're, they're, they're out there. Um, but when you see the real deal, you know, you, you want them, yeah. you want to support them. So. I don't see knockoff carbon wheels coming around anytime soon, though. I'll tell you that. I'll tell you what. If somebody makes a set, they're going to find out right away that it doesn't work. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly my point. Yeah. Well, and another interesting thing was I said, so are we going to see uh, brand extensions from Forge Line? For example, we're going to be seeing forged aluminum door handles and steering wheels and shift balls and stuff. And they said, uh-huh. no. No, all right. We're a racing wheel company. All right. Uh, this is what we do. And I love that, you know, because, yeah. y- you know, how often do you see, you know, somebody, and again, it's a, it's an indicator of a privately held company, too. You know, you don't mm-hmm. have an investment group saying, well, you could you could make forge line bumpers and, and <laughs> put them on 10,000 Camaros. You know, it's money, money. And, and right. No, 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 no. This is what we do. Right. So that was uh, admirable also. And it, it, it really made me think about yeah. how we do stuff in our shop and how we run our yeah. business uh, because everything we do is custom. Sure. But it's not as defined because for them, it's a size, style, finish, done. Uh-huh. Th- those are your options. It's, it's every option of a wheel, but it's specific, you know. Yeah. And, sure. and I, I don't think we can limit our customers to those choices but maybe we need to look at a few things that are way out of our wheelhouse that we might wheelhouse nice. Ah, <laughs> nice. <laughs> that are, are, are way off our spectrum and say, well, maybe we don't need to be doing that because we're better at doing this. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and an example might be, you know, sometimes, you know, somebody brings us in a, you know, a, a car that is kind of a collector, kind of an older car, but has like some miserable timing problem that's going to take all kinds of diagnostic you know nobody mm-hmm. wants to be doing that in our that, that's more of a mechanic job right you know right but if but if you want you know a fuel injection conversion on it and you want custom metal work uh-huh. that's what we do you know right like say say if that guy who who um had his, his dodge Murata restored if he came in and said hey i need to i need it tuned up well it's a Murata. Uh, and we're not really in the tune-up business on well, that kind of a car. But but to him we are, because um, because we did that car. You did the car. I mean, you did the whole resto on it. Yeah, which is which is what you do. But, but at, at the same time, and we joke about that car because we we love the customer, we love the car. Yeah. But we're not in the Murata restoration business. Uh huh. I I don't. I'm not waking up tomorrow hoping I have a whole parking lot full of Murata's that need to be restored. <laughs> right. I value, I highly value that job. I, like I said, I, I thought it was a mm-hmm. great car. I loved it. It was an example to show people that you don't need, you know, something super unusual to ha- have a car that means something to somebody. And I, uh-huh. I respect that. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, but 
it, it gets a little tricky, you know, because mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not saying we need to turn, turn work away that we don't think is cool enough or whatnot. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but Rod, our sales and marketing director, had a great point. And he said, you need to have your technicians bringing their A game to the stuff that they're passionate about. And if they're working on a, a project that they're not passionate about instead of what they would like to do, so, you know, if, if our lead fabricator is is doing the tune-up on the Murata, he isn't doing mm-hmm. what he wants to do. Right. So his passion drops, and then everybody mm-hmm. gets frustrated, right? So uh, Ben, our, our cameraman, while we were at ForgeLine, took some time to talk to the guys running all those machines. And you mm-hmm. might look at these jobs as kind of being repetitious. I mean, you're taking mm-hmm. aluminum out, putting it in the machine, running the program, taking it out, grab the next one. Uh, especially the, the the grinding guys. I mean, these guys are grinding wheels all day, you know. But every one of them were like, we love this job. We're making oh. something that's going to leave here and go on a racetrack and go win races all over the world. We don't know where it's going to go, you know. Right. And, and yeah. it's got to look awesome. It's got to perform. And the variety is in every wheel is, you know, there's, they're going to make four at a time. So these four and then the next four and the next four. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, uh, to Forge Line's credit, they, they value their employees and they want to make sure that they're all challenged and that they understand that there's a bigger picture, you know, for what they're doing, yeah. which is, again, admirable. It's, uh, um, it, it sure is. They also recently landed some deals where they're the homologation spec wheel in certain racing series where you that's what you run is forge line wheels really so yeah the the the, the, um there's a camaro racing series and a a few other there's a mustang deal that you buy the car from from chevrolet for example as a ready to run race car you put your graphics and do your tune or whatever but it comes on forge lines and Hmm. and, uh that's an indicator that says yeah they they know what they're doing Uh (laughs) yeah oh yeah spec wheel for a full series yeah Um, that's pretty slick yeah, so it was cool. It was a great experience. Good for them. Yeah, and uh, uh, like I said, I learned a lot. So again, I'm not I'm not here to. Um, they're they're not paying me to say any of this stuff, right? But I I think it's important to share these kind of stories because uh, it really totally. makes you think. Yeah, and it was inspiring. So, right on, man. Good. I'm glad we were able to do that. Yeah, and it's funny because you'll see people who. You know, right away, you put a picture of a car with forged line wheels on it, and they'll be like, oh, those, I, I don't like that style. It, it's too modern looking, or, uh-huh. you know, it, they're, they're too, too big, you know, too skinny of a tire. And I get all that. But yeah, I, that's fine. I mean, that the wheel choice is, is a completely subjective thing. Correct. Um, but I do think that if that car is supposed to go do something, uh-huh. that all of a sudden that style choice isn't the driving motivator. And if you knew what they were, you might not. You know, you might not have that same opinion. Right. I got you. I got Um, you. And don't get me wrong. There is a huge uh, marketplace for cast wheels and for for lower buck stuff all day long. Yeah. And that's, mm-hmm. that's what's on my own car, you know, a set of mm-hmm. cast aluminum wheels. Because my 62 Ford's never going to see a road course, so I'm not worried about that <laughs> safety factor. These wheels mm-hmm. basically just, they got to be round and they have to look cool. You know, and there's that. That's the vast majority of the wheel business, uh, yeah. and and I'm fine with that. They're fine with that. Everybody's fine with it. But it's when you start mm-hmm. to do something a little bit more is when you mm-hmm. you need that uh, that deal. So, so there you go, man. That's more than you needed to know or want, initially wanted to know about my trip to Ohio. Well, I'm glad I know about it, though. I'll tell you what, so it's, it seemed pretty interesting stuff. Really, really cool stuff. Yeah, very much. Sounds so. like a great company doing the right thing and i hope we see a lot more from them yep well they'll be 25 years old next year so they're i, I, awesome. don't, I don't think they're going away so good good all right well i'm you know curious to know how how bad i botched this trivia question so did, did it come to you at all throughout no, the, no, the it episode didn't. it didn't it no didn't. dang it it didn't I'm I'm not that mentally limber anymore so <laughs> you know what if, speaking of that uh Somebody was trying to teach me something at work the other day, and he was going so fast. And I said, "Listen, listen, man, my my brain is like like a dried up sponge. I mean, you start pouring water on it, it just sheds the water because it can't absorb anything. You got to be slow with it. You got to let my brain slowly expand to take in the knowledge. Nice, a dried uh, so, up sponge. Yeah, it's exactly what it's like sometimes. 
he's just like zipping things at me. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, you yeah. know how old I am, right? Yes. Like, you, right. You got to be cool here. You got to be easy on me. Yeah, I got I'm a little man. A little smack of that this morning. As a matter of fact, my uh, my college, uh, my alma mater sends out their alumni newsletter. So mm-hmm. my thing from Illinois State University came in the mail, and it dawned on me that uh, today's college graduates weren't even born when I graduated from college. Oof. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's by, nice. By a couple years. <laughs> so, and the surprising thing is people say, well, you look so young. You know, you just... <laughs> amazing. Amazing. Right. Yeah, only, only How the, do you do it? Only the blind have said that. Yeah. Anyway. All right. A trivia question answer. I asked you what a Mustang in the mid-60s... Uh, actually, from 65 to 73, they had to do this. What, what was it marketed as? And Kevin said the old M1. Yeah, sounds like an wrong. expressway in England, doesn't it? Yes. But um, the act, the the correct answer is the T5. See T5. See, I I told you it's a number letter, and I said TKO. Yeah. You said T1. It's just like T2 or something. Uh, no, like, I, I, oh, I, I did. Oh. I did that. I was trying to hold it together. I said T2. I said Mark II. But I also said TKO. And you, you, you looked at me. Like, and, and my brain was getting there because a TKO is a stronger version of the T5 transmission. Exactly. So and I was thinking. I was I almost, I almost threw a tidbit <laughs> out there to say, think transmission. Think transmission. Yeah. But I couldn't do it. Couldn't do it to you. That's it. The Ford T5. Yep. Darn it. <laughs> yeah, I just ran out across an article about it from that Haggerty put out last year. I'm like, oh, this is pretty interesting stuff. So uh, yeah. that's a, that's, there's a trivia question in there, and that's what it's got to be. Yeah, how about that? Well, mm-hmm. I told you. I knew the how and why. I just didn't know the yeah, what. Yeah, yeah, All right. Well, in your case, we mm-hmm. asked about the technology of the auto-dimming headlights uh, right. pioneered by General Motors, eventually adopted by all the domestic manufacturers what year did it come out and the bonus and i'll give you any of the three what was it called what did it change to <laughs> you said 1994 it was the auto high beam dimmer and you said it evolved into the safety dim with a t oh that's the worst thing i ever heard in my life <laughs> for, the, for the thing well so 1994, you're pretty close. Um, it came out in 1952. Oh, Jesus! <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. I got to step away from this right now. Holy Jesus. <laughs> uh, but it did appear first on Cadillac, so you were, uh, you were right there. Uh, oh, look at me. But Cadillac, Oldsmobile, Pontiac, Buick um, all had this. Uh, okay. and, and initially, it was called the Autronic Eye. Ooh, the Ultronic Eye. Yes, and it looked out on the dashboard. It was. It looked like a War of the Worlds alien thing that, that uh-huh. looked out. And it was a photo sensor that uh, would sense the oncoming light, and it would trigger uh, some vacuum tubes and relays, and it oh, would nice. click down the high beams to low beams. By 1960, well, by 58... Um, There was a sensitivity adjustment because uh, people were driving down these highways at night and a reflective road sign would trigger it. Oh, nice. It would flick the beams on and off. Um, And then eventually they put that sensitivity knob on there. Uh, By 1960, I believe, it became uh, the Guidematic. The Guidematic. The Guidematic. And the Guidematic, um, it was uh, kind of neat. It actually had what they called the Safety Salute. Not T, but the, the, sa- the safety salute, and the safety salute was right before it dimmed. It would f- it would uh, flash the the lights off, so the oncoming car would know that I understand my high beams are on. I'm going to flick them to the off position and turn the low beams on, so you know that I'm being that courteous. I'm on, that I'm on board here. Yeah, right, right, right. Oh, and uh, eventually, it became part of cars today they all do it now you know you don't even notice it uh uh but that's uh that's pretty wild so part also mm-hmm. also part of the uh uh the twilight sentinel package on gm cars which twilight turns sentinel. turns the headlights on at dusk automatically and then off oh in daylight. right 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 so they got all that stuff together yeah so. mine does that so, I had this uh i had an 83 cadillac a long time ago sedan deville and it kept 
after you shut the car off, the headlight stayed on Correct. for a period of time. And this is pretty uncommon. And probably at least 50, 60% of the time, someone will say, hey, buddy, you left your lights on. Right. Yeah. I'm like, no, no, they'll turn themselves off. It's, it's cool, yeah. man. It's cool. Yeah, and there was a knob on there. You could adjust that delay. Yeah, yeah that yeah. was part of the Twilight Sentinel package. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, so there you go. So unfortunately... Yeah. Wrong itty wrong wrong wrong. I think that's correct. <laughs> wrong <laughs> wrong, itty, wrong wrong wrong. So good to know yeah, we're, we're yeah, both yeah. losers today. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, well shoot. <laughs> yeah, but you know we're still still winners even though we lost. Yeah, winner winner chicken dinner. Yeah, yeah. So now I I remember it's T5. Mhm. Yep, yep, mm-hmm, yep. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, listen, it's been fun, and uh, I appreciate you uh, listening to my uh, expounding upon the wheel industry. <laughs> no, I enjoyed it. I really liked, I liked learning about new, uh, new things like that. Compelled to share It's pretty that. cool. And uh, next time, I also thought you know, we'd, we'd give the listeners a little more suspense about the GTO, which we'll hear about more next time. Boom. How about right that? on. Yeah. Because there's really not a lot to tell. <laughs> well, hey, don't ruin it for them. Come on. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you have till the next one to get something done. Yeah, I'll, I'll get something done this week. Yeah. yeah. So uh, be sure to uh, subscribe on iTunes, uh, Stitcher, Google Play. Uh, where else? You could hear us on TuneIn Radio and on the website at v8radio.com. Also, the Facebook page is buzzing with action at V8 Radio. So thanks for uh, for hanging out with us. Uh, as always, keep the sunny, the shiny side up. <laughs> Hopefully, sunny now that it's nice out. Right. And uh, we will talk at you next time on V8 Radio. <laughs>